Nā mihi nui kia koutou. I'm Alison Greenaway from Manaki Whenua Landcare Research. Really delighted to be um, part of the group pre presenting work today. This is work that Raywin, Piet, Lara Taylor and I have done for one of the cross-program projects for the Sustainable Seas Challenge. So we're talking today about enabling marine ecosystem-based management and the question, is New Zealand's legal framework up to the task? So the, uh, this project, we have written up our findings in a journal paper which will be um, available later in the year. Uh, we're keen to hear at the end of this presentation how else you'd like us to share these findings. So this is work that was done, as I said, by Raywin, Lara and I, and we're really keen to hear from you about how else we can share the insights that we've got. So the vision for the Sustainable Seas Challenge, and we're just trying to get onto the right slide now. That's green, does that mean it's open? So the vision for the Sustainable Seas Challenge is that New Zealand has healthy marine ecosystems providing value for all New Zealanders. One key part of this is enabling ecosystem-based management or Aotearoa. Now, the leadership within the challenge have been developing principles for ecosystem-based management for Aotearoa. And you'll see those on the slide. And these are key to the work that we've done. So as Raywin talks through, she will discuss each of these principles and how they are or are not enabled through current legislation. We won't discuss them in depth now. If you'd like to find out more about them, please go to the November Resource Management Journal, the November issue of the Resource Management Journal, where you'll see a, a paper in that that discusses these principles and how they've come about. They do reflect international discussions, um, but have been um, tailored to meet what uh, New Zealand's needs. So now I will hand over to Raywin, who will look at um, how these principles can be enabled through New Zealand legislation. Thank you, Alison. So, we started, uh, when we started this work was to really sketch out what is the legal framework that currently governs, governs uh, New Zealand's marine area. And you'll see a, a, a kind of brief summary on the slide. I think what you can take from that is that it's pretty uh, complicated, fragmented. Um, there's numerous pieces of legislation um, there's multiple agencies that are applying them. Uh, Māori customary and treaty rights haven't been fully resolved over the marine area. And we're also seeing a growing uh, number of bespoke regional uh, pieces of legislation, which I think indicates the fact that the system itself isn't well configured. And you might ask, well, why is that a problem? Uh, and it really is because the the data is showing us that the state of the marine environment is, is not in a good state. And we touched on the 2016 Marine State of the Environment report, which highlighted the degradation of our coastal marine habitats, the perilous state of our marine birds, and the issues, issue of ocean acidification and warming. So we have some significant challenges ahead. First of all, I will provide a brief overview of these sort of key pieces of legislation and then I will whip through the seven EBM principles. Uh, there's a lot of detail but um, that will come up on the slides but I'll just touch on some of the points uh, and then hopefully we can have a, a good discussion on them. So the first piece of legislation uh, is the Resource Management Act. Uh, it came about in the uh, really late 1980s when the thinking was very much based on the Brundtland Report which talked about sustainable development. So that's why sustainability, sustainable management was the overriding purpose and, and the whole debate about ecosystem-based management hadn't really kind of bubbled up into the legislative sphere. But despite that, it does provide many of the elements you might look for. 
it, it uh, looks at integration of the catchment in the sea. It has um, some detailed policy in the coastal policy statement. It decentralizes a lot of decision making to councils with oversight from the Environment Court. Um, and it has a whole um, sort of structure of policy statements and plans, a growing role for Māori in terms of decision making and broad public participation. So it's, it's quite, the Act certainly was ahead of its time. The Exclusive Economic Zone Act, of um, sort of call it the EZ Act, is essentially a cut down version of that. It was a gap filling piece of legislation when the Oceans Policy uh, Program was up and running, it identified that there was no real environmental legislation for our EEZ, and this was designed to fill that gap. Um, so it doesn't have the policy and planning framework that we have in the RMA, uh, doesn't really provide for firm environmental bottom lines, uh, centralised decision making, uh, has a Māori advisory body that I'll talk about, um, and although public submissions, there are no merit appeals and the Environment Court doesn't have a role. The Fisheries Act, uh, again, picked up the, the sustainability theme. Interestingly enough, when uh, a task force was uh, looking at what a new act might contain, it, it had a strong recommendation that it should incorporate ecosystem-based management, but that wasn't taken through in the political process. So it talks about sustainable utilisation. Um, it's very much focused around the creation of private rights in uh, fish stock harvest uh, and single stock management based on the concept of maximum sustainable yield. Around that, it does have um, environmental and information principles that provide some guidance. Um, uh, most decisions are made by the minister and there's a, a pretty weak policy and, and planning framework. In fact, the legislation makes no provision for policy um, and, a, and a kind of a very uh, sort of sketchy framework for plan making. And there's no mandatory public participation requirements at all. There are consultation provisions, but no right of the public, in fact, to participate in decision making. Oh, sorry, I'll just. Um, treaty legislation, there's a, a lot of different pieces of legislation in the marine area. They have addressed uh, treaty claims to fisheries and aquaculture. Um, and that's been through the provision of quota, space and cash. There's a, a series of customary fisheries management tools provided for uh, under fisheries legislation. Uh, and there's also uh, legislation that is addressing customary claims to the marine and coastal area. None of those have been confirmed and nor have treaty claims to the harbours. So it's, it's an area that's still very much in flux. Um, conservation legislation is probably the oldest, um, uh, dating back, of course, to the Marine Reserves Act 1971. It's very fragmented. Uh, the focus, rather than sustainability or EBM, is on conservation. There is provision for broad policy, conservation um, management policies and uh, strategies and plans. And again, it's largely a central, centrally um, run system. So that's a very brief overview of, of the legislation. Um, and I'll now go through the seven principles and just uh, really give you some of the highlights from our analysis. So the first principle uh, looked at governance in the treaty and to what extent uh, the legislation provided for that. And, and it, it was really quite a range between the, the various uh, pieces. The RMA um, is quite strong. Uh, both through the recognition of the treaty and in Māori interests in part two, but also there's a strong role for iwi in plan making, uh, provision to uh, take into account iwi management plans, um, ability to, in fact, transfer functions, and more recently, um, mana whakahono arohe uh, participation agreements that iwi can initiate themselves. So quite a, you know, quite a lot of provision there. The EZ Act, um, sort of has uh, none of that. Uh, there is no treaty clause. Um, there is a Māori advisory committee that has been in fact very effective, but um, it is only advisory committee. And there is a recognition of existing interests, which include treaty interests. Um, the Fisheries Act, as I've indicated, uh, has Māori going quota, quota through settlement and customary fisheries management tools. 
conservation has the strongest treaty obligation to give effect to uh, the treaty uh, principles, and, and that's been tested just recently in the Supreme Court with the Mai Tai case um, on Motutapu Island. Um, the Marine and Coastal Act I've touched on, um, and I, I'll mention here the Hauraki Golf Marine Park Act. This is one of the pieces of regional legislation that uh, provides for management of the marine area, and that has established a partnership model between iwi and agencies through the Hauraki Golf Forum, and was in fact the precursor uh, to the Marine Spatial Plan for the Hauraki Golf. Um, the next principle uh, talks about really focuses more on the ecological issues, um, that the system is connected, that there are cumulative stresses, and these of course are the most difficult ones to manage and the ones that we're struggling with at the moment. Um, again, the RMA does pretty well on this area. It certainly recognises these processes. It uh, manages catchment to the sea, so both the regional councils have that jurisdiction. They have plans, the regional policy statement covers both. Um, and there's provision for joint planning and certainly spatial planning within the ambit of the RMA. And it, it, it recognises, as does most of the legislation, that most of this more recent legislation has adopted the same definition of effects, which talks about cumulative effects. Um, the EZ Act um, is, is much weaker, as it is on most elements, because there is no planning. Um, and so it's basically a case-by-case -case assessment of a particular application. Uh, there is now provision to make regulations that could provide a spatial planning framework, so that's an opportunity uh, that's yet to be taken up. The Fisheries Act recognises these connectedness, um, but there's a, an, an, an inbuilt tension in the legislation between the, the narrow focus of the management based on maximum sustainable yield, which is mandatory for the Minister to adopt um, in most cases, but um, within this broader uh, connectedness. And ma maximum sustainable yield and a single stop management model really doesn't take into account the, the broader connectedness of stocks between with other, other stocks or with the broader marine environment. Um, conservation, as I said, it's a, it's a bit of a kind of hodgepodge of different pieces of mainly dated legislation. Um, there is some sort of hope with strategies, but uh, probably requires rationalization of the law. Um, and just touching again on the Hauraki Golf as an example of regional legislation, um, that has a very strong focus of integration. That was the kind of reason for really putting the act uh, together in, in the forum. Uh, and it establishes common management objectives across all those regimes, so fisheries, RMA, conservation. So it's an interesting example of how you can sort of connect together or knit together fragmented legislation through overlaying uh, objectives, and it also provided the basis for an integrated marine spatial plan, which was very much focused on those cumulative stresses. I mean, the other interesting thing here we touch on, um, I won't really have time to go into it, is the interface between the various legislation, and there's the recent Motiti case or cases um, in the Bay of Plenty looking at the interface of fisheries and the RMA and, and what is the role uh, of councils under the RMA in managing the impacts of fishing activity on biodiversity. Turning to people, <laughs> um, people as part of the ecosystem, and I thought this was, this was quite interesting, just looking at the legislation and how they dealt with that. The RMA very much um, sees humans as an integral part um, of the environment, and that's in the definition. Um, the Marine Area and Coastal Act, um, uh, very much recognises the strong relationship both of iwi and hapu, but also of the public to the foreshore and seabed, and um, that's quite interesting. The EZ Act, uh, when it comes to these matters, only considers economic well-being, so social and cultural well-being are not um, included, and that was a conscious decision, I think, uh, based on the thinking that um, it was so far away that people really weren't connected to it. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case. Fisheries Act um, does uh, uh, include people, but it's only really in the con uh, context of utilisation of resources. So um, uh, it's the focus is on that and not on its sort of in situ values of the marine environment. Um, conservation is more on the uh, sort of enjoyment of nature, um, 
and historic resources by the public, so slightly different focus. And the Hauraki Golf Act, which I haven't put up on the screen, but um, that, that's actually very strong on, on the, and it seeks to protect actually the association of both tangata whenua, but also people and communities with the golf. Um, and I think that's, you know, a very positive uh, approach. Uh, sustainability, so healthy environments uh, for the future. When we looked at that, this, we kind of focused on two elements. One was the extent to which the future generations were kind of uh, explicitly kind of referred to or considered. And the second was the extent to which um, the legislation contemplated or enabled environmental bottom lines so that uh, uh, key aspects of the environment could be protected for future generations. Um, and as you'll see on the screen, um, all the all the legislation uh, talks about, refers to future generations. It's kind of implicit in the definition of sustainable management, um, but only uh, really the Resource Management Act uh, contemplates environmental bottom lines. And uh, we of course have the, the um, EDS versus King Salmon case in the Supreme Court that confirmed this uh, and confirmed that the coastal policy statement establishes those for a range of matters. Um, in the coastal marine area. The EZ Act doesn't have any environmental bottom lines. It has a list of uh, matters to be considered, which include both economic and environmental, uh, and they are matters to be weighed up and on a given priority. Um, uh, and there's no uh, real provision for binding policy that could set environmental bottom lines. Fisheries Act um, is similar, uh, apart from maximum sustainable yield, that is uh, a clear line in the sand uh, that the management should be above or at of fish stocks. But other than that, um, really no ability to set environmental bottom lines because all the environmental aspects of the act of matters to be taken into account, but there's no requirement uh, that they, they should be applied. Conservation, um, really the only environmental bottom line is in the sense that it can create um, you know, conservation areas, marine reserves, marine mammal protection act. So in that way, it can, it's got a tool uh, to protect things for future generations. Um, decision making. So how are decisions made? And um, is it in a collaborative manner? Is it participatory? And again, I think uh, we see quite a, a, a broad range. The RMA has always been a very participatory piece of legislation that was um, integral to its design. Um, but those rights have been um, sort of uh, reduced progressively over the years in an, an effort really to streamline <laughs> um, processes. Uh, so the current situation is that only 2% of resource consents are no publicly notified, so one couldn't say that that was a participatory process. Planning is, has broader rights, but um, in recent uh, um, amendments to the RMA, I think the 2017, we have new processes, one streamlined, which uh, takes away any right to a hearing or appeal. The other is a collaborative planning track, which is quite interesting given um, the mention in the principle of collaboration, um, but it's pretty clunky and no one's used it and I don't think they will. The EZ Act um, has public notification and, and hearing rights, but no appeals, no merits appeals. So again, a more streamlined version than the RMA. The Fisheries Act, as I mentioned, quite surprisingly, there are no statutory public participation rights in any decisions or plan making or anything. Um, and because there is no statutory policy and only very sort of sketchy um, provisions for fisheries plans. There's really no opportunity or no right, if you like, for the public to influence the, the framework or the framing that would guide decision making. Um, conservation, uh, there's broad participation in the development of strategies and plans. And I think quite interestingly um, that they, uh, collaborative decision making, I think, in this area has been evolving quite fast. The Act itself, um, those plans are approved by a conservation authority. Uh, rather than a minister or the government. Um, and then we've had the evolution of Marine uh, Protected Area Forum. We've had uh, local initiatives like in the Guardians of Fiordland and uh, Te Korowai. So quite interesting evolution there. Of course, the, I suppose in the marine area, perhaps the most collaborative process, um, or most ambitious one was the sea change Taitimu Taipari's Marine Spatial Plan. Um, 
and that's really been supported by the, the Haraki Golf uh, Park Marine, Act, Marine Park Act. Um, moving on, so we're up to number six, um, and then there's just one, one more after this, and then I'll wrap up and we have some questions. So this is really talking about what, what is the basis of decision making. Um, before I go on to that, I'll just say on the collaboration and participatory decision making, um, just because the Act doesn't require it, of course, doesn't mean that it can't take place. And a lot of agencies, and I know that um, Fisheries New Zealand is in this category, do um, provide opportunity for public submissions on, on most of their decisions, um, but it's not actually required in the legislation, so it's good that they do that. Um, yeah, so talking about the basis of decisions, um, science, mataranga and community values. Um, what are decisions based on? Most, under most legislation, I mean, we, it is a kind of evidence-based decision-making process in the RMA because there's a section 32 requirement. Um, we're making plans that councils assess the cost and benefits. I think that um, very much focuses um, attention on what the impact or effect of uh, these will be. Um, sorry, I'm being told to move closer so you can hear me. Um, the coastal policy stat, uh, statement itself uh, talks about incorporating Mataranga Māori in decision making. Of course, there's um, assessments of effects for applications, and they're usually pretty rigorous. Um, the EZX are similar. Uh, uh, an application will have an impact assessment of the uh, effects on the environment. The Act itself talks about the use of the best available information. Uh, and there's a positive, I think this is quite interesting and, and something not in the other legislation, there's a positive obligation on the consent authority to seek out information. So this is like an inquiry role. So it's really saying just because the applicant or a submitter hasn't presented you with information on this topic, it doesn't mean that you should uh, actively seek out information yourself. And I think that's probably a pretty positive development. Um, but Mataranga Māori and community values are not referenced in the EZ Act. And I, as I said, um, some of that, I think, related to the thinking that the EZ was so far away uh, from people that there were no values associated with it. Uh, Fisheries Act uh, has similar information principles, in fact, to EZ and talks about best available information to be used, so a strong focus on evidence. But there's no real assessment, there's no requirement for an assessment of effects. Um, for fishing activity to take place, and that's probably a weakness. Um, and certainly the customary man fisheries management tools enable Mataranga Māori to be applied. So these are taipore, mataitai, and um, temporary closures um, are very positive in that respect. Um, the Marina Coastal Areas Act, uh, Areas Act um, again, through creating those rights uh, to iwi in, in the uh, Marina Coastal Area, potentially will enable Mataranga Māori to be, to be more strongly applied there. Uh, conservation really doesn't deal with these matters and, um, and doesn't really talk about a, a, you know, assessment of effects. But, but we really thought um, that one of the biggest issues here was not really the law, but it was the lack of investment in science because um, you, know, you can kind of say, we, yes, we'll, we'll base our decisions on the evidence, but if the evidence isn't there, um, you're then making decisions, you know, on the basis of very little um, information. I think the other point I'll make is um, in the Sea Change Taitimu Taipari project, um, that project was very much set up um, to integrate Mataranga Māori and science um, in that process and in the plan. And, and certainly the research we undertook indicated that perhaps it would be more successful on that point than most any other planning processes. So we certainly you know, have something to build on in that case. So the last principle um, talks about uh, you know, the flexibility and the ability to adapt our management to monitor uh, what's happening and to acknowledge that we won't know. There will always be uncertainty. Uh, and this was kind of quite interesting to look at the various regimes. In the RMA, there's, there's a positive ob obligation on councils to monitor both the state of the environment, uh, the effectiveness and efficiency of their plans, and they also monitor uh, compliance monitoring with resource consents. That doesn't mean that this is done all that well in some places, but it certainly is a positive obligation. There's also an obligation to review those uh, policy and planning documents, and the, the legislation certainly recognises that there's uncertainty most of the other, well, all the other 
um, pieces of legislation we looked at um, uh, really focus just on compliance monitoring. So that's monitoring consents, but not monitoring the state of the environment around it. And I think um, the issue there that is, of course, that you can't make sense of data from a, from a site normally unless you have an understanding of the broader environment in which it's operating, because it's not possible to determine what its effects are if you don't understand what else is impacting the system. Um, the EUZ Act explicitly deals with adaptive management because it, uh, it recognised that we knew very little, I think, about the deep sea. And so applications would be considered in the absence of good science. And so um, it requires the decision maker to explicitly consider whether adaptive management would enable consent to be granted. Um, it can't be granted uh, if you are caught under the marine pollution provisions, which are, are much tighter. Uh, linked to our uh, obligations under the London Convention, which is an interesting kind of aspect to that Act. Fisheries Act, again, there's, there's really no obligation to do anything. Um, uh, and I think this has been not only in terms of um, fish stocks and state of the environment, but also to review management settings, um, because as we know, for a lot of stocks, they, um, there hasn't been a review for many, many years. Um, so, so a positive obligation maybe, you know, could be a good thing to actually encourage agencies to be a bit more proactive. Um, in terms of uh, conservation legislation, uh, there's no requirement to monitor, but again, there is a 10-year review of the documents. And of course, we now have the Environmental Reporting Act, uh, which is a very positive development. And so we now are getting uh, uh, every three years a national report on the state of the marine, um, marine environment. Uh, uh, that's great. I think that's a great, uh, great progress. But the issue there is that there is not a link between what that report says and a management action. So what the legislative framework uh, lacks is um, linking the results of monitoring to a response by um, management agencies. And it's not uncommon to, and we've seen in the, this in the Hauraki Gulf, to have a, uh, there we have state of environment reports coming out every three years, and they're really just re um, measuring an ongoing decline. Uh, without an adequate response. So it's hard to really summarise all this. Um, there's a lot of nuances, I think. Um, these principles, each one, you know, is quite, uh, has a lot in it when you start to unpack it. So I think it's hard to really summarise with where we're at, but as a stab, <laughs> we've put together the slide um, just to compare the legislation. The Resource Management Act, you know, actually places pretty well I think it provides a pretty enabling um, framework. A lot could be achieved, a lot more could be achieved than we currently are doing under that piece of legislation on most of those criteria. The EZ Act uh, falls short because it's sort of cut out a lot of the aspects um, that the RMA has uh, that enable EBM. Uh, and one of the uh, prospects, in fact, is to possibly fold that act back into the RMA regime so we have one covering miles on the EUZ. The Fisheries Act, um, as I said, really has this internal conflict. Um, on one hand, it, it focuses very much on a, a stock-based maximum sustainable yield, um, which isn't very compatible with ecosystem-based management in commercial fisheries. Um, on the other hand, it, uh, in, in terms of the customary fisheries management tools, um, it's been pretty enabling. Not to say that those tools don't have their, their um, problems in terms of the way they've been constructed. Um, conservation, as I said, it's just fragmented, outdated and inadequate. Um, strong on treaty matters with the re recent Supreme Court, but really um, that clearly, I think, needs to be modernised. So what, what, you know, where could we head on the way forward? Um, I think there's two main things. Uh, there will be the forthcoming treaty settlements over marine areas, and that could well uh, see the establishment of co-governance arrangements over some of the harbours. Um, I'm thinking of places where we've got the Piper Harbour, uh, but also places like the Waitemata Harbour, um, Further Thames, uh, and so that, that will, I think, help enable EBM. The issue with that, of course, is these settlements are with individual iwi, and so they're spatially uneven. They don't provide a kind of nationwide approach to how we might address this, and that is certainly a gap in the current framework. Secondly, um, we concluded that the marine spatial planning provides a 
promising approach. It really provides for many of the elements we're looking at. Um, building on the sea change project, uh, that included a co-governance approach involving uh, iwi very much at the top table. It, it was a collaborative process. Uh, it involved um, mountains to the sea, so it looked at the whole system and it really sought to bring together Mataranga Māori and science um, in a way that strengthened really the contribution of both those elements to the plan. So we could build on that um, and look at marine spatial planning as a promising way of moving forward. Uh, and the third thing is legislative reform. Um, uh, the marine area has always kind of been the poor child of our legal uh, framework. Um, uh, we've failed, we've had a few attempts, but we really failed to uh, put together an oceans policy and to rationalise our marine legislation. That's kind of what we need to do. It needs to be rationalised and modernised and strengthened. Um, and, and interestingly enough, of course, the government is embarking on a resource management system reform process uh, starting later this year. Uh, and I think that could be an excellent opportunity to start to look at uh, how we could start to improve um, the legislative framework so we can further support EBM. So uh, that's all we've really got to say on the topic and i um, really now looking forward to a, a good discussion and hearing your views and questions. Thank you very much. We're going to be able to see your um, questions come up and so please write them in. Apologies. Um, from Lara Taylor, but she's not here in the auction session room with us. She is online, so if you've got some questions uh, that Lara will, um, can answer, she will type up her thoughts and um, I will read them out. So, first of all, um, we have a question from Rosalind Squire um, from Tasman District Council. And the question is, I'm looking to Robin here. You press the button. Okay, sorry. We just got some. All right. Oh, no. Um, you open, open the screen up. Yeah, I wonder if they can hear us. Uh, no. Right, we can hear you now, Rosalind. There was an issue before. Please. Go right, ahead. I think I accidentally pushed a button. So we have you on screen, but I, I don't have an immediate question. Apologies. I think we just pushed the wrong button. Oh, you pushed the button. Okay, right. Let's see who else has got a question. Um, it does require you um, putting it, them into the, the, the group chat box. So um, if you type it in, I'll be able to um, read it out. So we have here, um, Lara um, was just wanting to elaborate a bit further regarding the co-governance principle. Um, the RMA has potentially enabling provisions, but the nature of the RMA uh, allows Māori values and interests to be compromised. So it's not necessarily authentic co-governance. Um, so some more work needs to be done in the way that we view and care for Taonga and um, a mechanism to elevate environmental and cultural um, values above economic values. Um, so she's suggesting um, that the recentering of Māori knowledge and institutions to create an enabling space, and there's examples of the Te Uruwera Act um, and the Whanganui River Act um, provide more enabling legislation for both ecosystems and for Māori. Um, we're very keen to hear from you about the opportunities that you see. So Raywin um, has pointed us in a couple of strong directions. Be keen to hear if um, that resonates with you and you also see some possibilities around that, or if there's other areas that you're looking um, to, to enable ecosystem-based management. Yeah, 
so it's quite silent on mm -hmm. the group chat. Um, I oh here we go. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so um, Catherine Short is saying great presentation and interesting analysis. Did you look at short, medium, and longer term enabling? So looking temporally, and is anyone looking at the personification opportunity for the marine environment? Right, so we, um, this project was really focusing on the current situation with our current legislative framework. Um, and the idea was that it would set a, if you like, a basis to then start looking at where we might head and I think um, the, you know, the suggestion you're making about whether we should look at um, creating um, the marine environment, giving its own personhood is a really interesting one uh, and something that could be uh, looked at going forward. So I think uh, the idea is the next phase of the Sustainable Sea Science Challenge will start to look at how we might need to or how we might want to uh, change our legal framework to better support EBM. So that would be something yeah, to look at then. So Lara's wondering um, what do you all um, think about a nationwide marine spatial planning approach? So there is debate about the scale at which EBM can be or should be implemented and that it perhaps it needs to work across multiple scales. So is the na national or nationwide scale an appropriate one? for marine spatial planning. Any thoughts on that? Well, in the meantime, while you're thinking about that, um, we've got the Marlborough Girls um, College Marine team here, and they, we know, have been doing some fabulous work in Marlborough and looking at policy changes. Um, so they've published their ideas in the April um, 2019 Resource Management Journal, um, looking at marine, the Marine Guardians model, and this includes personhood for the Marlborough Sound. So thank you very much. That's an excellent response to Catherine's question. So yes, indeed, people are looking at personification. Um, and if you look in the April 2019 um, issue of the Resource Management Journal, you'll see the excellent work these girls have been doing promoting personhood for the Marlborough Sounds. Now we've got one from Steve. Oh, that was Steve, right. Um, Catherine was responding that she didn't think the current approach of um, localised marine spatial planning is viable. No, so I just want to, I think, um, Catherine, you're saying local uh, MSP legislation. Um, I think you're probably referring to the fact we've got, uh, you know, legislation from Fiordland, we've got legislation with Kaikoura, we've got legislation for the Haraki Gulf, um, we've got, um, you know, talk about legislation for the Marble Sounds. Um, and, you know, my thinking is that I think that's happening because our, our nationwide legislation isn't fit for purpose. And so people are kind of saying, well, look, we need something, you know, this isn't doing it for us, we need something else. And so we'll do a local one. And, and um, although you don't want to sort of stamp on innovation, I think we should learn from those examples and look at how we could build that into a national framework that would provide something that local communities could use, you know, for their purposes, uh, rather than a proliferation of uh, lots of uh, you know, the regional pieces of legislation. Kelly Morgan is asking us if we've got a draft report that we could share before the paper that we've written is published. And that's what we really are keen to hear. Um, we are thinking about writing it into a short policy brief um, or a summary piece. I'm wondering if that's what you'd ideally like to receive. Um, so yes, we're really keen to circulate it um, as quick as possible and just be really like some feedback on in what format would work best for you. Um, we've also got um, another 
question, um, a comment from Lara that she agrees with Catherine um, that the marine spatial planning legislation is spatially ad hoc and is unlikely to provide the total solution. Um, it's the same issue with um, treaty settlement legislation and Takutai Moana. Um, but there are good lessons being learnt through these processes, which are providing a foundation for ecosystem based management to be built from. Catherine's response is that there isn't a link between the principles of co governance and human activities and property rights under the Fisheries Act, especially with regard to Māori. Did we consider that from an opportunity perspective? Is there or is there not an opportunity? Right, there isn't, sorry. Isn't there, she's asking the question, isn't there a link between co-governance and human activities? Catherine, do you want to just explain um, what you're thinking there? Because I think you've, you can see this link. Um, and as you're typing that in, um, we will look at the question that Rosalind Squire is asking. And she's wondering where we could put a national marine spatial plan. Where would a national marine spatial plan fit with regional coastal plans? So there would there be an overlap with regional coastal planning processes and marine spatial plans? Yeah, I think um, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not sure whether you would want to develop, say, one marine spatial plan for the entire country. Maybe you would do that for some key high level strategic issues. Um, and maybe for something like the Z, you might want to look at a, you know, a plan. But I think um, probably marine spatial planning makes more sense, you know, on a, a more regional basis or a, you know, a basis that makes it like the Hauraki Gulf, like the Marble Sounds, um, and those kind of areas. I, the strength of a marine spatial plan is it's taking a strategic look across all the management regimes, um, so it's not confined to the RMA also covering fisheries, conservation, and other, other legislation. So it, it has that ability to knit that together and really take a strategic look um, at it. I think we need to do some thinking about how these might relate to regional coastal plans. That could be, I mean, I think of the Waikato River and the vision and strategy that's kind of, um, it has been created outside that legislative regime, but it's it then given effect to as a national policy statement. So there's those kinds of um, sort of legal uh, uh, tools you can use for, for a, a marine spatial plan to uh, be given effect to through perhaps regional coastal plans and other plans, you know, under Fisheries Act and um, conservation. Thanks, Raylan. Um, going back to the point about how to disseminate this work, Terry's asking actually for a more in depth report that um, because of the breadth of this topic, it would be good to see greater detail around the basis of the analysis of the findings. Um, and Catherine's um, responding that we're not going to get rid of property rights, nor should we, as they're fundamental to the Treaty of Waitangi Fisheries Settlement. So did we consider building on that through uh, the, those two EBM principles of co-governance and humans as part of the ecosystem? Um, and are there any opportunities um, through the Fisheries Act? That therefore provides when you look at that. So I think she's pointing to some interesting further work that could be done yeah. considering that. Um, certainly, um, I mean, that's an interesting point. And certainly uh, looking also at the marine and coastal area and the extent to which rights are granted there, uh, customary rights, that then provides a mechanism um, for EUE to have, you know, obviously a much greater engagement, involvement, say, power, in what happens in those areas. So there's definitely a link between a right and then the ability to, um, you know, participate, you know, from a position of greater power and decision making um, in, the, in those areas. So, you know, definitely, um, but this doesn't just relate to fisheries, it relates to other rights. So there's aquaculture, for instance, treaty settlement um, and aquaculture space. Uh, there's also uh, settlements on land in the catchments. So yeah, certainly an interesting point. We're coming towards the end of our discussion um, time. If you have got a burning question, please do write it in now uh, and we will be able to cover it. There's one um, that Rosalind has asked, which is 
if the RMA was extended to the EEZ, who would administer it? Is that something that is being contemplated by anyone? Well, I have heard um, Minister Parker mention this, so I'm not sure what's in his mind, um, uh, but probably just in passing. Um, I think um, how it would work is you'd have one piece of legislation, which would be the RMA, which would be tailored, and you'd have the EPA making decisions in the EZ and councils um, in coastal areas, but under the same umbrella of principles. Um, uh, I think there's an open question, actually, as to where you might draw the line between a council uh, responsibility and something like the EPA, because I'm not convinced that um, many councils really have the you know, the resources and expertise required to manage up to 12 nautical miles, which is quite a long way out. And now we're starting to see things like the prospect of offshore salmon farms, for instance, um, stuff happening out there. It's expensive to get the science. Um, I think we really need a hub of expertise in marine management um, that could start to look at these issues uh, rather than fragmenting it all around the country and councils. So, yeah, I think it's an interesting idea, issue to, to discuss the jurisdiction. We've got great engagement from Catherine, who's agreeing <laughs> with um, that, like the idea of the hub of expertise. So, right, um, I think we've got what could be our last, um, and it's response from Lara, that uh, marine spatial plans could potentially replace regional ones mm. if a marine spatial plan covered more than one region. There is currently provision on the RMA to make uh, plans across regions for an area such as a harbour, and this can be done collaboratively with more than one council and potentially transfer of powers to iwi and hapu to involve them in the decision making and management um, too. So that is all currently within the RMA. Um, and this can be done where it makes sense and perhaps um, this could change, there could be a change in how we make plans and manage our Tonga. So Lara's mm -hmm. pointing there to another opportunity that does um, exist within current legislation. Well, thank you all very much. Um, please do email Lara Taylor, um, Rowan Pitt or myself um, if you'd like to continue this discussion. Uh, we'd be keen to talk via email or meet you face to face. And yes, we will be um, circulating uh, the findings of this research as soon as possible and um, keen to hear ideas for how, how we could drill down further and get um, more depth into these questions. Thank you very much. Bye for now. Bye.